Hey guys, welcome back. Skitzone episode eight. Topic today is randomness, random integers, random floats, and how we can use randomness in assembly. Um, and ultimately, I don't see too much value to randomness in engineering, maybe for Monte Carlo simulations, maybe for that cryptographic mumbo jumbo that people do. Um, really though, I see value for randomness in just games. You guys may be familiar with this game show Deal or No Deal. Um, basically, you had a bunch of cases between like a penny and a million dollars, and uh, you could pick one and keep it, but you couldn't open it. Instead, you could open up other cases and see what was in them, and kind of narrow down what's in your case based off the cases that you've opened. And then every once in a while, the banker would give you an appraisal of your case, um, and you could take it or leave it. And that's why the show was called Deal or No Deal. I bring that up because obviously it involves randomness, and I implemented that randomness in assembly here. And this says no libraries, nothing. So if I run this binary, we get an implementation of deal or no deal in assembly. So I'll pick a case, pick 17, and you can see it gives us a running expected value of the total number of cases that have been unopened so far. So I can begin to open cases, case zero, case one, case two, case three, that was a bad case, case four, case five. Anyway, you can see that these cases are randomly shuffled. And we'll talk about how that works in, uh, in today's video. So here you can see I've got a an appraisal of 157K. I'll take that, that's a decent amount of money for me, so let's sell. That was a bad deal because our case apparently had three fourths of a million inside, so that kind of sucks. But anyway, who cares? I'm not gonna be too sad about that. <laughs> so um, the topic today is randomness, and the question we'll begin with is, how do we get a random number? So. It's pretty straightforward. We have two instructions to use. We have RD seed and RD rand. They both are pretty much interchangeable instructions and they both use the hardware noise on the computer in a different way. This is how I understand it. I could be wrong about this, by the way. But the way I see it is that there's some kind of hardware noise. Maybe it's thermal, maybe it's electrical noise. And RD seed takes that noise itself or maybe with some manipulation as the output value. And that would be kind of like a true RNG because it's just querying or probing or measuring some quantity on the processor as noise. So that's gonna be slow, but it's also gonna be have, having more entropy than the alternative being RD Rand, which is a pseudo random number generator that is seeded once in a while by the hardware noise. So this is faster, but also less random than RDC. We're gonna use RD Rand in this series because I don't care about entropy. Honestly, I just want a random value. Um, if you cared about that stuff, you could use RDC as a drop-in replacement for what I'm gonna show you in this video. So just one more thing about pseudo RNG. You guys may be familiar with like the, the XOR shift algorithm and things like that. Um, basically, these just turn numbers into other numbers. Let's say your first number was, I don't know, like seven. That would be your, let's say that was your seed. You could use that seed for your next number. Let's say it was 13. And then you can use that seed for your next number, I don't know, three, right? And you could basically re re keep using that XOR shift or whatever algorithm you're using to generate new numbers from the previous number by using that as, by using the previous number as the seed. Um, I guess the advantage to this is that you don't have to pick a seed, you can use the hardware noise as a seed every once in a while. So that's kind of the, the cool thing about how the way RD Rand works. Okay, cool. How do we use these instructions? Well, there's the complicated answer and then there's the easy answer. So complicated answer is, well, you can pass in put to both RD seed and RD Rand, either a 16, 32 or 64 bit register and it will drop a bunch of zeros and ones in there for you. So you type RD Rand REX or already seed REX, and both those instructions will give you 64 random zeros and ones in REX. So pretty straightforward. There is one caveat, however, and if you read the documentation, it says that the it takes some time for the randomness to, to work, right? Either to, to query the hardware, you know, noise or whatever it's doing behind the scenes. And so 
we have to check if there is a random value available for us or not. And to do that, it says here, the carry flag indicates whether a random value is available. And so all you have to do is check the state of the carry flag when you're generating your number. So here's how you would do it. You'd have a loop and you'd, you'd attempt to fill RAX with zeros and ones and check the carry flag. If it was not set, you would try again over and over and over and over again. In my experience, this never happens. Like from what I could tell, you could comment this out and it works just fine. But just to be safe, um, put this loop in there just in case it, it, it matters on your computer. Okay, how can we use those random zeros and ones to get a an integer of consequence, like a random number that we care about? Let's say you wanted a, a dice roll. Let's say you wanted a value between one and six. So I have this function here called randint, which returns a assigned long an integer value. And it takes in two inputs, one being the lower bound, one being the upper bound. So if you wanted a dice roll between one and six, you'd pass RDI is one and RSI is six. And it would put RAX somewhere between those two, inclusive of the boundaries. So how does this algorithm work? I call it an algorithm, it's not really an algorithm. The first three instructions and the last three are just management of the, I guess, registers. Again, our calling convention in this series is that no register values are allowed to change state during a function apart from the output register. So again, we save and restore those register values. And then here you can see those three instructions from before, actually two instructions, um, which just make sure that we've generated an, you know, an available number in RAX. And then the question is, how can we turn those zeros and ones into a integer between one and six? Because remember, 64 zeros and ones is not going to be between one and six. I'll tell you that right now. And so the way that works is you have to use division. And so if I remember correctly, the way division works is you basically have um, RDX and RAX as like a 128 bit long register, and then you can divide it by something. So here you can see I'm using this instruction div RSI. It basically divides that 128 bits in there by the 64 bits in here. And when you, when you do that in RDX, you'll have the remainder. And then in RAX, you'll have the result of the division. So we can use that to our advantage by basically putting a range in RSI. So let's say, for example, this random number was like a, a million and RSI was six, then this operation would yield some random garbage in REX that we don't care about. That would be dividing a million by six, whatever that happens to be. And it would be putting the remainder of the division in RDX. That remainder is always gonna be between, I guess, zero and five in that case. And then we can use that for our random number, right? Our bounded number. So that's what we're doing here. We're basically doing exactly that. We are XORing RDX that sets those high 64 bits to zero. And the low 64 bits, those are just, actually, we don't have to even do that. We could leave it the way it was, to be honest, because we don't care about the actual result, but we may as well XOR it just for completeness sake. Um, then what's RSI? RSI is our range, so you can see it was originally our upper bound. We incremented it by one, and then we subtracted off the lower bound. So at the end of the day, it's, it's the range. And then we divide that RAX by the range, and then RDX again contains the re remainder of that division. We can add that remainder to our lower bound. Remember, RDX was going to be between zero and five, so we can add between zero and five to one and get between one and six, and then return that value. So that's pretty much how this operation works. So we can basically adjust our random number between our boundaries. And again, this instruction, it could be skipped, I think. 
with no ill effects, but I really don't care. It's a very fast instruction anyway, so. All right, cool. What about a random float? So again, 64 zeros and ones is great and all, but it's not a float. Unless that's not a float that you would want. Maybe you want a float between zero and 100, you have to somehow bound the problem between those two. And the way I've done this is kind of interesting. Um, I have this function called rand float. Basically, again, it returns a value, a double precision floating point value in x and m zero. And it takes these two bounds, lower bound also in x and m zero, upper bound in x and m one, and it returns a value between those two bounds. So again, these first four instructions and the last four instructions here those just manage the registers and preserve them across function calls. And then these three lines, that puts random zeros and ones in RAX for us. And the last was that six lines actually do the heavy lifting of converting that zeros and ones string into a float between our bounds. And so again, I have a, a range in X and M1 so I converted our upper and lower bound to be a range. Then what I did was I basically took the random zeros and ones in RAX, and first I shifted off the leading zero, the leading sign bit, either a zero or a one. So now it's just 63 bits of zeros and ones. That means I'm gonna have a positive value basically in the register. This instruction here, I mentioned it in a previous video, this converts that integer value into a floating point value with, with the same value, basically. So this turns our random 63 zeros and ones integer into a, basically a float of the same value in X and M2. Then I'm multiplying that quantity, that more or less integer quantity, but floating point represented by tiny. What is tiny tiny is a value that is one half to the neck to the 63rd. So it's a very small quantity. So basically I'm turning our random number into a very, very, very tiny quantity in X and M2. Then I'm multiplying that tiny quantity by our range and adding it uh, to our start value. So basically we're, we're, we're scaling between basically zero and one our range. So it, Pretty straightforward, not too complicated. I would say it's even easier than before because there's no remainders or division or stuff like that. It's just straight up multiplication. So that's how that works. With that out of the way, let's look at the code. So I have four examples here, plus deal or no deal. I have two examples that do integers and two that do floats. And then I have two options for single values and two options for an array of random values. So we'll talk about how that looks right now. So let me hop into the virtual machine. So you can check out all the code in the Soy Hub repository, by the way, link in the description. Um, here are our five examples. Let's go through each one. So example A, that was our random integer. How does this work? Well, what are my includes? I have an include for that random integer function. I have a print integer function and I have a, a print character function to print out a new line, I think. So here's how that works. Um, the first three lines, that's just me setting the boundaries. So RDI zero, that's our lower bound. RSI 100, that's our upper bound. And then we're calling rand int that generates a random integer value. And we print it out and exit the program. So if I run this, we should get a single value on the screen between zero and 100. So let's just test that out. 68, looks good to me. And we can generate more as well, sorry. Like this, 36, 28, 55, 78, eight, etc. cetera. Okay, cool. Example B, how about this? In this case, we are doing an array of random integers. So we have a function called random int array and we have our function from before called print array int. So we can basically do the same thing as before, just with an array. So I have a memory location here that's 16 quad words long. It starts off being zeros, but we're gonna fill it with random values. So here you can see this 
six lines basically fill that array with values between zero and a thousand. Typo, let's change this to a thousand. So when I run this, we should be printing out 16 values between zero and a thousand to the screen. So let's do that. What, why, am I, why am I leaving Vim out of Vim? So here you can see I've got values between zero and a thousand, and I can do that multiple times and get different values each time. Cool. How about example C? This is floats, so if I open up the code, you can see how this works. Again, I have that random float function and our print float function from the previous video. And as you would expect, we have those lower and upper bound being set to values from memory, so zero and 100 floating point values in memory. Then we call random float and we print it out. So very, very straightforward. If I run this, we should get a value between zero and 100 in floating point, which we do. And I can run that multiple times and get different values each time. Cool. Next example, example D, the same thing, just going to be for an array of floats. In this case, I have a, a function that generates an array of floats. Why would you want this? Maybe you want to have a bunch of random quantities at once. Let's say you have a a game where you have a bunch of enemies appear on the screen and you want their X and Y positions in floating point and you have 10 enemies so you generate 20 random floats right so that's one possible use case for this and it's as you would expect we have <clears throat> again we have an array of 16 quad words that's enough for 16 double precision floating point values and we're gonna fill that with random values between 0 and 100 and you can see if I run that, we get 16 values between zero and 100. Got pretty close there, 99. Got pretty close there, three. So you can see it works successfully. And I can do it multiple times and you can see we get different values each time. Very nice. Now our last example, um, the deal or no deal example. We already played this, I'm not gonna play it again, um, but how does it work? Well. I'll show you how it works. Oh, actually, before I do that, let me show you the file size. So, um, yeah, so you can see it's 3,000 bytes in a file size. So it's not, not very large at all. It could be made much smaller if you'd like. Um, I didn't try to optimize it for size, we could. A lot of that is just like dealing with printing to the screen and stuff like that. So it's not all just uh, logic and and, uh, and randomness in there. So anyway, in the code, what are our includes? We have a bunch of includes here. We have, again, a random int array. This is how we're kind of shuffling our cases. We pick a random array of integers for our shuffle algorithm. Um, and then we have functions for printing, functions for reading from the screen, reading from standard input, I should say, as well as parsing ints like when I, when I type 16 on the keyboard, we have to parse that string into an actual integer quantity, right? <clears throat> so we have functions for that, as well as we have a function for moving the cursor around the screen to help us print things uh, a little bit nicer. So we have some helper functions that we created here, one called print cases. This prints all the case stuff to the screen. You can see it clears the screen, moves the cursor to the top left, prints some of the brackets, the numbers, it also prints the colors, so you can see um, if it was a low value that you opened up like a dollar or five dollars, it would print in green. If it was a medium value case, it would print in yellow. If it was a high value case, like a million, it would print in red. So, yep, that's all there. That function would basically print our cases to the screen, and this would print our instructions like what to do, what numbers to type, what letters to type, etc. And um, yeah, down here is where our program actually starts. I can explain that a little bit better by going above and showing you our ELF header. So the ELF header you can see here has an entry for the start address. So everything before the start address is just kind of code that we can use. So all our includes are just basically copy and pasted into memory right here. The entirety of our random int array function gets copy and pasted right here in code we don't execute all the code linearly, we execute starting at the start address. 
So all this stuff here is just front matter. We actually start at start. So you can see our first thing is we basically generate an array of shuffles. So how we're going to shuffle our cases. So make sure you are our memory arrays down here for what we're going to use in this program. So our cases are here. So we have 0 through 25, so 26 cases. And we have an array of statuses. So this will basically contain the value of the case if we've opened it, or it will contain a negative 1 if you've not opened it yet. So it starts off all negative ones. And then down here you can see this value. So case, case number 0 will always have, well, the case ID 0 will always have $0 in it, as well as case 25 will always have $25 in it. Of course, we're going to shuffle the cases around, so it's not going to be linear like that, but it will have all the values in that list. Okay. So basically, we just have a game loop where, where we are constantly doing two things. One, we're printing out that case list and the instruction list, but we're also computing the expected value. So you can see here, normally for expected value, you have to add up all the cases and divide by the number of cases that you're dividing by, right? But you can be kind of clever and know that, well, there's always going to be a certain number of cases, 26, and there's always going to be a sum of them in maximum. And you kind of can do the opposite. So you can basically subtract off from the maximum value. So here you can see if you add up numbers 0 through a million in that list, you get 3.4 million. And there's a total number of 26 cases. So what this loop does, it just basically subtracts off from our running sum the cases we've opened so far, and then it decrements off our case number, R14, to basically count the number of cases we have left. And so this will constantly be recomputing our expected value and saving it in register RBP so we can print that out uh, every iteration. So that's pretty much how this code works. You can peruse it in more detail. But let me just show you one more example of how this, this code works. So you can see on the bottom right there, that's our expected value running every iteration. So as I, as I open cases, that value will change. So yeah. With that out of the way, we have basically covered the entire content of this video. Um, Oh, wait, one more thing I forgot to mention. That was a, a bad game. Um, is the shuffle algorithms. Excuse my cats. Um, so the shuffle algorithm, we're basically using a Fisher-Gates type shuffle. So how that works is we've generated our shuffle array. That's an array of kind of shuffling actions. So we have 26 shuffling actions between 0 and 25. And the way the shuffling algorithm works is very simple. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Basically, we just keep exchanging um, elements with elements from that shuffle array. So we keep just swapping them around, um, you know, two at a time, swapping them, swapping them, swapping them, as we go through all the elements. And that enables us to get a decently well shuffled uh, array of cases, basically. So you can check that out. On, uh, on your own time, figure out how Fisher Gates shuffling works. But with that out of the way, we're pretty much done with the video. Um, we covered all the basics. Now you guys know how to generate a random series of zeros and ones in a register. And you know how to convert that zeros and one string into an integer or a float for your own purposes. So thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video.